everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Big Idea. I'm your host, Jason Seymour, and I'm the spokesperson for the U.S. Mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, otherwise known as ASEAN. So U.S. ASEAN started this show because we know that Southeast Asia is filled, filled with many exciting leaders. And I am so excited to bring you a very dynamic leader today, someone I definitely wanted to be part of our program. So welcome, Maral. Welcome to the program. Hi, 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 Jason. Thank you so much. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for joining our show. Just for everyone, her full name is Maral Dipo Diputro. You'll let me know if I mispronounced that. It looks like I did okay. Uh, it's uh, such a delight to have you on the program. I'm a big, big fan of what you do. And I I'm just excited for you to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here, actually. I'm very, I've been uh, excited the whole week, every day. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, we are both chatting and we're both very happy, but we're both living in Indonesia. And of course, Indonesia is going through a horrible surge in COVID right now. So I just wanted to say a quick word at the top to all of our audience throughout Southeast Asia. If you're dealing with these lockdowns and, and deaths and people in the hospital, we are feeling it too. And we just, we, we hope that the vaccines get distributed. The US government is, bringing a lot of vaccines to Southeast Asia, and a lot of countries are coming together to solve this worldwide pro uh, problem. So we just, we hope, we pray, we get through this quickly. No. So let's start with you, Maral. Uh, let's start our conversation. I'm very excited about what you do. You are the founder and CEO of a social enterprise called Tamu. So first tell our audience, what is the significance of this name, Temu? Right, so, um, so Temu in Indonesia means meet. Uh, so bertemu is to meet, so meet. But uh, so a, a little bit about Temu before I, maybe I share about the name. So we are a social enterprise. Our, our goal is to help reduce the number of poverty, but also specifically through unemployment, reducing number of unemployment in Indonesia. Uh, to be specific, helping individuals residing in slums with vocational high school background. In Indonesia, we have SMK, a vocational high school background. So we help our friends with vocational high school background to, uh, for them to get jobs. And so with that, uh, that's why I gave them the name Tamu. Uh, one, of course, is to meet, but there's also two very philosophical reasons. Uh, one being in, in the Nigerian language, Tamu also means to bring someone to a higher level, to a better position. So considering that one of our beneficiaries is basically uh, our friends who are less fortunate this, uh, or with a lower education background. And so we, we um, there's a tendency sometimes a stigma that we tend to think, oh, the poor, they want so much, or they're asking so much from the government, they're somewhat a burden. And so I would like to bring them to a better situation where, and also uh, another reason, uh, Tamu in Indonesia, there's um, it's the plan uh, uh, ginger, it's a ginger family, Tamu Lawak. It, one of their character it's that uh, when it's attached to another plan it does not uh, burden uh, the main plan so it's a, it's a mutu mutualism and so uh, therefore that's also the mindset that i hope uh, by as we as the manage to reach our goal to reduce number of unemployment in indonesia we also provide the uh, ability to our friends who are uh, who economically are uh, middle to low so, and, and as they're able to self-support themselves, they will not become a burden, but they're seen as, uh, as also individuals that can that very much contribute and, and uh, 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 support the, the government economically, of course. Even. I so, yeah. love that image. I love that there's, that uh, my mind was so with you, with that illustration that you depicted of the tree and, and the plant metaphor. I love that. So I do want to pick up on something that you were saying about how you were looking to provide more opportunities for people who only have a high school education. In Indonesia, what, what is the breakdown? How many people in, in Indonesia have less than a high school education, have a high school education, or go on to uh, 
tertiary education. Are you familiar with the numbers? Yeah, I, I, that's actually the reason why I haven't started. So uh, the, our total workforce in Indonesia is around 120 million people. And 90% of that uh, only have, uh, or with high school or vocational high school background or lower. Um, and so imagine that's approximately around 100 million people in Indonesia work for our workforce actually have that qualification. And so that's actually the very reason why the number is so large, especially now that we're shifting towards in, uh, for IR. And uh, so a lot of the jobs that are currently being filled by our, our most of our workforce uh, might be disappearing or might be changing. And so it's important to start investing and investing in this market. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And before we get to the labor element, just to stay for a moment on education, what are some of the cultural or family barriers that prevent people from either completing high school or going on to a college or university education? Um, okay, so, well, first of all, um, even before that, there's a gap, uh, I, in my opinion, there's a huge gap of education in Indonesia. Even when they go to, let's say, vocational high school, or even if they go to high school, the difference, despite we might be referring to the same curriculum, but uh, the, the quality of education that each individual might be receiving from one school to another is actually also very different. Uh, so that's, or, that's already one. Um, so it's not only about getting people to school, but having the people to really understand, uh, once they're in school, the, the quality of education that they get is also uh, um, massively varies between each schools and also each provinces and area in Indonesia. So that's one. Uh, another thing is also because um, a lot of people, once even when they're in school, they don't really plan their career or they don't really plan their lives. Uh, we have, even in university, I have a lot of, uh, I have even myself, for example, I might be taking certain degree, but then my career path will be very different to my degree, which I think it's also important. So that, that same mindset also happens in front with our friends who are in vocational schools. Uh, as they enter, and then I ask a lot, I interview a lot of them, and then when I ask, why did you choose this school or this particular vocational school, or why did you choose this, this major? And they would say, oh, because that's the only major that I can get in, or most of my friends is there. And then, so once they graduate, and then I ask again, so what's going to be your next career? What's going to be the career that you're going to choose? And most of them would choose, oh, um, whichever background that they have, a lot of them would say, oh, I'll maybe most likely I'll just get it. I'll get a job in a restaurant as a waiter or something like that. And so you see, uh, that's also an issue. Um, they choose to go to vocational path, for example, because they, they know they would like, they need to work, let's say, or they would like to work as soon as possible. But they should also have, the, there's uh, the mindset of building their career, choosing their career path. It's not there yet. So they just somewhat like a lot of, uh, I think we just go with the flow. And then eventually once you start looking for a job, uh, the, the, your skill is not in line with the demand in the market. And so, um, so that's the, but overall, and also the very reason why I started Tamu is because I think um, we keep on developing our curricula or, or we approach issues on education in Asia, not based on real life data. Uh, countries like America or uh, Singapore and a lot of developed countries, they, we, we, we spend so much on data, on real life data, especially on employment. Therefore, we'll be able to set our curricula or we would be able to provide uh, whether it's uh, any type of uh, trainings uh, based on the future demand of the market. So right now, 80% of our vocational high school are not working. Uh, there's no particular reason why that is, but in my personal opinion, it's because we keep on producing graduates, but it might not be in line to the demand of the market. So we have the, the people maybe with certain set of skills, which I know it's very valuable that should have been able to connect them to the market, but the market demand is very different. And so, yeah. We, I have a couple of follow -up questions, but I want to share with you a question from our audience. This is from an Indonesian named Gusti Anshila. And Gusti wants to know, is Temu the same as Temu Karya Integrasi? Yes, yes, it's the same company. <laughs> so in Indonesia, the name, the full name is Pete Temu Karya Integrasi, and then, well, we call it Temu. So yeah. Right. And Gusti, we'll have the website in the description below. We'll add that for you. So you, so when you were saying that you're very concerned about curriculum, is there an element of Temu where you are contacting schools or working with education departments to make suggestions to reform the, the vocational programming? 
Right. So, um, so the re as I mentioned, the reason why I created the MOO is because I think it's important for us to start investing in data. So, uh, at four years ago, when we first started, uh, after going to the after doing our research, uh, going to slums, and then we we created a job portal. So, but this job portal is specifically for low skilled uh, workers, and the the idea is to start getting the data. Uh, Honestly, at the beginning, even when I was doing my research, my first hypothesis, uh, hypothesis, uh, why, uh, and the reason why we're, we have a lot of this problem on, on, on unemployment, I thought it's because of lack of skills. But once I started going to slums, and I did that like for one and a half years, four times a week, eight to 12 hours a day, and when we go to slums, shadowing uh, our friends, and then that's when I realized, actually, a lot of our friends, their uh, poverty somewhat equips us with, with skills. Um, you know, we have to fix our motorcycles. So we learn about, uh, about motorcycles and then we, uh, we have to create our own house. Uh, the woman usually they start selling things. So that's entrepreneurial skills. So a lot of our workers actually have these skills. And from that, then I said, and then when I actually came and offered, hey, uh, Bapa or Ibu, would you like me to teach you something or to increase your skills? And they would say, can you guarantee that I'm going to get a job? And then I thought, oh, okay, that's, that actually makes sense. We have a lot of NGOs with a lot of government programs teaching and giving all these trainings, but then somewhat, uh, it doesn't really guarantee that they're going to get jobs. And so that's why I started by creating this uh, the platform. And from there, after about a, a six months or so, I realized that uh, what is actually missing is a soft skill training. We don't actually have a lot of soft skill trainings. So the, for the past years, what uh, we yes, we have been providing trainings, but mainly on soft skills. So we've went to several uh, SMK in Jakarta uh, and teaching them um, about soft skills, uh, the, even or uh, also the idea of building careers. So that includes like how to make a CV or how to attend interviews, the kind of confidence that you need, uh, time management, things like that. And, and surprisingly enough, uh, from all the schools that we went, uh, almost all the uh, either teachers or, or principals would came up to us and said, in my 15, 20 years of learning, of teaching, we've never had anyone that came and teach us all these things, even though they were actually quite basic, uh, basic uh, uh, career information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you, so if someone reaches out to Temu, and says, I would like to start my own social enterprise. Would, would Timu help that individual? And if so, how, how, what kind of guidance would Timu offer to that person? Right, so we don't, um, so as a company, what we do, so we, we uh, so towards, the towards, so we have two, two sides, right? One being the beneficiaries is a, is a job seekers. Uh, mainly the vocational high school graduates job seekers. And on the other side, we have the companies. Uh, most of our clients are hospital, uh, in the field of hospitality or FMB. So what we do is that the company would actually come to us and then they would said like, for example, oh, I'm about to open this hospital uh, or sorry, this hotel and I'll be looking for this amount of workers with the skills. Can you please help us? And then we do the placement. So, uh, but of course, um, in the process, as we interact a lot with the job seekers and that's our main beneficiaries, uh, we, we do get um, the different kind of requests. Like uh, some would be asking us about, um, you know, uh, we have fun, uh, like interesting thing. We have an online, before this, when our job portal was fully on, we have a customer service 24 hours. And at 2 a.m. in the morning, usually we would get our customer service would be uh, getting uh, messages where people start to tell about their life stories and have, asking for some sort of like career guide, also mental health support. And so we, we have different kind of requests. And our task is basically to help in any way that we can to, to decrease the number of unemployment. So, yeah. Thank you. So my question was based on a question we received from Nurwayen. I hope I said okay. your name correctly. I hope that answered your question. So I do want to ask you, so you are attempting to match people with uh, lower skills uh, that are at a lower skill level with employers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips? So what kind, what, what's one of the biggest mistakes you've seen job seekers make? Other than having, right. a, weak, other than having a weak CV, apparently. Uh, there's a, right. a lot of need to develop CV writing skills. Yeah. I think it very much goes back to the to the mentality. Um, there's this um, confidence is very important, right? Uh, and and I mean, like for example, if we're if we're trying to sell something, and in the case when you're applying for a job, you're about technically you are your best product. 
But then I, I tend to get this impression sometimes from, from our fellow uh, job seekers. Uh, they're not so confident about, about themselves. They question, uh, can I really actually get this job? Is it even po possible for me to start, to start uh, you know, having a job in, in such a big company or, or a well-established company and things like that? And, and that, that confident, uh, the, the insecurity, uh, the, in, uh, the company would actually, can actually uh, get that. Um, and sometimes in the event when we're trying to place our workers, there's also several stages where we even have to meet them first, right? And even us, of course, we will get that impression. And once you're not, once you have this insecurity, it's how can you actually promote yourself well? Or again, you are your best product. You're trying to convince them to hire you. I'm like the best uh, employee that you can, you know, out of the, or the applicants, I'm like your best options. But once you are actually not confident, uh, I think that's one of the biggest mistakes uh, that, that we have. Um, and going um, to elaborate more, it's also something to do with the CV though, because people tend to think that uh, companies are only hiring if they went to like one of the top schools or if they have good grades and that's it. But it's not that. The, men uh, the mentality is also very important, whether you're, uh, you're someone that thinks outside of the box, whether you don't really easily give up. And, 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 and these characters are the one that companies are seeking, whether you're applying for a waiter or whether you're applying for an administration work in a company. Uh, it's always about the mentality, the soft skill, right? And so uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes is that the mindset and also not having the confidence, some, very much to do with the soft skill, I think. That is an excellent point. Personality is so important. I remember yes. being on an interview panel uh, when I was assessing a program in Africa and a gentleman came in for an interview and he had attended an excellent school he looked so good on paper, clicked all these various boxes, but during the interview, his personality was so toxic, so abrasive mm -hmm. that he turned everyone off on the panel. So it didn't matter that he was one of the most competitive applicants on paper. That interview, mm -hmm. how people present themselves, how they feel about themselves, how they inspire panelists or the interviewer to feel, all that, all that element is so, so important. And, and this is a good segue to another topic, which is something of, of which you are very passionate, and that is mental well-being. So you helped to found a group called Founding Well, and I would love if you talked about that a little bit. Yeah, so uh, Founding Well is um, some sort of a support group, uh, a movement as well. Uh, founded by me and several of social entrepreneurs in Indonesia. So you know how recently everyone's been talking about burnout, uh, burnout from work, and at the same time, we're more and more more conscious about uh, uh, mental health. And uh, especially when you are doing social enterprise, whether it's uh, something to do with environment or whether it's something to do like what I do, employment, with dealing with people, whichever it is, it drains your energy as well, right? Because you're so passionate about what you're doing. Uh, that means uh, you also have this mission, the impact that you're trying to create. And sometimes in the process, you also receive a lot of these uh, stories. Like for me, uh, when I go to the slums and then you see all this inequality and then you see how different people are facing so many challenges. Uh, and, and sometimes it, it also somewhat, the, it, it it, um, it makes you very sad or some, to some people, maybe there's also anger inside. And so, and then we, we start to realize it's important to actually have a safe, uh, some sort of like a, a safe group, safe haven for, for us to share. Because uh, it's always nice when you can share without being judged. So the key is that Founding Well was created because we, we realized the importance of having a listening ear, but making sure that these people would not actually be judging you in the process. And so that's basically what Founding Well is. That's fantastic. And, and that taps into something that I encourage people all the time. And, and we've talked about this in various ways that people need to find mentors, they need to find role models, and they need to find peers. So finding a network of people that one can talk to for insights and advice. And so, of course, we encourage people to become parts of the members of the YSEALI network, because it's a very, very large group. And we have lots of people who are in lots of different professions and can be there for you for mentorship or peer review. So 
please consider, if you're not already, becoming a member, this is for the audience, uh, becoming a member of our Wysili network. Because of course, Moral, you are definitely part of our yes. <laughs> Wysili network. And I would love for you to tell our audience a little bit about Camp Theory U and some of the Wysili programs you've been part of. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, so I think it begins in January 2020. Uh, that's the first time I attended a program of Wysili, which is the Wysili Camp Theory U. Um, so uh, Theory U is a, it's, um, it's, it's a leadership uh, theory uh, that, is, um, that, is being, that is found by Professor Otto Sharma of MIT. And so there's a seven days program that I saw uh, where it was conducted by Resili in partnership with United, uh, United Diversity, United Diversity, sorry. And so uh, technic, uh, my mom is an alumni of, uh, she actually attended a similar program of MIT, which is the theory, uh, the theory U. And so I saw, I thought how this is actually like the shorter version and filled with young people. And so I actually, uh, that's the first time I participated. And, and following that, there's also the advanced course. And at the end of each camp, uh, we are given the opportunity to also teach others. So uh, our friends in uh, ASEAN and also Timor-Leste uh, online um, about the U theory. Uh, so that's basically the first that I participate. The second one, another recent one that I participate is the YCD workshop on future of workforce, uh, which is another program of the US Embassy with the ASEAN Foundation. And, uh, but what I, um, what the reason why I continue attending all this YCLE training is because, um, you know, I think as when we're young and trying to create our career, whether it's in private sector or government or or making our own enterprise, uh, um, we the, it's always important to upgrade our leadership skills, and and I think the YCLE platform has always been giving me the opportunities through the U theory. I think it's a very important theory to learn, as especially as a young uh, leaders or uh, entrepreneurs and then also the future of work so all this um so that is why i've been in the network because um it's nice to have uh, not only new mentors but also to be able to learn from colleagues of uh, your your own age right so so like a peer yeah obviously you appreciate the importance of having good mentors and that is at least one of the many elements that motivated you to start to move. And you know, I'm very impressed with the trajectory of your life because you were a corporate attorney, you <laughs> were working at uh, a reputable law firm. I'm, I don't know for sure, but I'll assume you had a good salary, everything was clicking. And then you said, no, I wanna do something different. I wanna start to move. And I wanna tap into a question that we have from our audience from Angelina Sorgiono, and that is, tell us a little bit about taking that bold step and how challenging that was for you to move away from that established road that, that you know, all the accomplishment you had there and to start something like Timu. Right. Okay, so um, in my case, uh, from a very young age, I, I knew that I think my calling is to give back. I'm very lucky. I think I'm raised in a family where my grandparents, my parents are nationalists. They're very, they, they're very much, uh, they always think that we have this duty to give back to the country. And then on top of that, uh, they also, I also learned since very young, looking at my parents, um, there's a genuine happiness that you, you get once you, when you're doing something good for others. So when you're helping others, giving back, there's certain happiness that you felt. And so from a young age, I knew that I want, my calling was to, to do something good, to give back to my community. Uh, uh, and then, um, so with that mindset, and then uh, my parents also told me like, wherever you go, try to always uh, leave something good behind. And so with all this information, at one point in my life, I started to think there must be a reason why we're born, race, or at least spend most of our life or even part of our life in Asia. So what, 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 uh, what can you give back for, for, to, your, to your country in this case, Indonesia for me. And so um, with that, I, when I was in, in I knew um, I took law actually, not because I wanted to be a lawyer, but because I, want, I, needed, I, I realized I needed to learn about what's the right and also the responsibility of Indonesian 
when I start to help others, I need to understand about that. And so when I graduated, I, I, I knew that I want one day to have a foundation or to start an NGO and things like this. And so I decided to become a lawyer because I wanted to save up money. And at one point I said, to, but then with that, after, you know, taking care of all these big, uh, have all these big clients taking our big, huge projects. And I start to think, why do you have to wait until you're old or successful to, to start doing good? Um, I think you can always start young. You can, you don't have to start big. You can just start small. And so from that, I just, after approximately two years, less than two years, I, I, I quit uh, from the law firm. And then I uh, work in there. I, I studied about the concept of, of, of um, working with communities. I helped I worked in the task force under the president for a marginalized area in Indonesia. And throughout that experience, I understand the concept of NGOs. I work with CSR fundings, with central government, with private sectors and this and that. And then I was introduced to the concept of social entrepreneurship, social enterprise. And I thought this makes sense. When you work with an NGO, sometimes the problem is once the funding is there, when the project runs, everything goes smooth. The target, they, we manage to achieve the target. But once the project ends and then we have to transfer it to the local, sometimes it, there's no continuity, it doesn't continue. While in social entrepreneurs and social enterprise, you are a normal company. So you have to make profit. And with this profit, the profit guarantees that you're, you can continue chasing your mission. So you can, you have, you still earn profit, but as a, as the social entrepreneurs, you also target yourself by looking at the number of impact that you can create. And for me, that makes sense. So uh, from law, after leaving my law firm work, and then I started doing the social work. And then until I found out the idea of social enterprise, that's when I knew, okay, this is going, this makes sense. So I can chase uh, my, I can chase, I pursue my calling and starting young and uh, giving back to Indonesia. So, yeah. I'm sure the law firm where you left was very sad to see you go, but all the, all the people you have helped are very appreciative that you ended up going in a different direction. Now, as you mentioned, you haven't just impressed me, you've impressed the government of Indonesia and you've impressed the president and you are part of the, I'm gonna try to get this right, the G20 Indonesia Sherpa Secretariat so uh, please uh, explain for our audience what you're up to with that. All right, so this is actually very recent. I just, I just updated my CV because it's only been a month, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> that I've, that I've uh, participated. So uh, next year, Indonesia yay, will be uh, holding presidency for G20. So we'll be hosting um, G20. And with that, uh, I'm currently in the team uh, under the, so the G20 Niche Sarpa Secretariat is under the, Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs. And I am currently working there to assist and also to help the government in doing anything necessary to ensure that uh, will be the whole event next year, uh, our uh, Indonesia holding presidency will be, uh, will go well. So that's my new role, <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And what are, you, what are you hoping to accomplish? What impact are you hoping to have as part of this uh, G20 Indonesia Sherpa Secretariat? Right, so um, actually this is very interesting. I, you know, um, I didn't, I mean, I know about the G20, but uh, I never really paid attention and never really think that I would be able to bring my mission or my agenda in in reducing the number of employment or tackling issues on poverty in Indonesia through international route. So what happened earlier this year, uh, a friend of mine uh, was, uh, so under the G20, we have a lot of engagement group, one of it being Y20, which is young 20. So every single year, every single country would send uh, their delegates, young, uh, in, uh, young people from Indonesia and other G20 countries and to, to discuss about issues matters and bring up uh, some sort of communique as recommendation. And uh, so a friend of mine was, elect, uh, was selected to be the head of the organization that, that sends delegates from Indonesia earlier this year. And so I, I was congratulating him and then he told me about it. And then I read more about G20. And then I thought one of the issues that they discuss is about employment. And that's when I realized all this time I've been focusing on creating changes and tackling issues on employment through a local channel. So doing things within the country. But if I actually, uh, take role in the G20, I might actually uh, influence or make changes through an international route. 
So my hope is as I participate there, uh, I might uh, be able to somewhat contribute to Indonesia in, and also the world, I guess, in, in, in um, giving recommendations or any way possible, in, uh, especially in my agenda to in, in decrease the number of unemployment and tackle issues on also employment and, and poverty uh, in Indonesia through an international route. Mm -hmm. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about poverty and unemployment. So, you know, no matter, many of our audience members are interested in a variety of initiatives where they're trying to motivate people, motivate people to think differently, act differently. Some people who are uh, in poverty, they, they, they have multi-generation poverty in their history. Their parents were poor, their grandparents were poor, their great-grandparents were poor. Some people get out of that. They, they're, they're, they're motivated, they go to school, they study, they, they wanna change the history of their family tree. And then some people, they don't change anything. What do you think are some of the barriers that, that uh, I mean, why do you think some people are motivated and successful at changing that trajectory and others fail? But is there, there, there isn't one formula, but perhaps you have some ideas on this. Yeah, uh, actually very interesting. Uh, the mission of, of the MOO is actually to break the cycle of poverty, specifically in urban slums. But we decided to use the breaking the cycle because when I, we went to the slums and doing our research at the beginning, it's, it's just like what you said, you will have the grandparents, let's say, being a carpenter, and so is the son, and so is the grandson, they continue. The problem is the gap of poverty in Indonesia, uh, it becomes bigger and bigger. And, and, and so with that, we start to realize poverty will only stop if we manage to break the cycle by taking someone out of that cycle away, giving them a better opportunity, which is why the tagline of the movie is, uh, of job opportunities for everyone. Um, so what uh, I think the, the biggest um, reason, one of the reasons, I guess, is again, is the mindset. Um, there's this, sadly, there's this, this mindset in Indonesia uh, where we tend to think, um, I have this quality of life or this is my economical condition because it is given like this. Or, or um, uh, there's this word called uh, the Indonesian expression would be That's just that's that's how um, it is written for me. I'm supposed or well, this is basically the condition that I'm I'm meant to have. Uh, and but then I don't think that is I honestly don't believe in that. I mean, we in Indonesian in Indonesia, we believe in God. And so I don't think the concept of I don't think God would actually that's a, I don't think that's a godly character, if I may say, because um, or a godly mindset in a way, because I don't think that's a very pessimistic approach about life. I don't think it's written that, oh, I am meant to be poor all my life. I don't think it's like that. We have to be able to chase. We have to be able to dream big and then to chase. The issue, again, is the, the mindset, because I think we are not taught from a young age to, uh, to dare to dream big. Um, when we go to school, people, or we go to which, in each level of our career, when we ask them, we just, what do you want to be? And say, I don't know. Uh, well, let's just see, you know, or, uh, or even when I ask them what, what, what the type of dreams that they have, it tends to be the same thing. Or like when I said before, when I ask most of the vocational graduates, if they're women, they tend to say, oh, maybe I'll end up as a waiter. If they're men, they, I'll end up as a goja driver or a driver. You know, it, it, that's because they only see the possible, like what are, um, their dream is only as far as uh, their, their community. They're, they're not, uh, we're not, we don't teach, I think, our young people in Indonesia the ability or, or even the eagerness to wanting to dream. So I know that it might be very uh, a naive answer, but I really think it's that. Uh, I remember, maybe this is uh, going away a bit, but I remember my mom told me uh, when, you, when she was young, she was studying abroad, actually in, in Madagascar, and uh, it was an international school. And every day the, the principal office would be open and during lunchtime, she, she told uh, me like, there's a huge book of different type of jobs in the world. And the kids uh, would be asked to go there during lunchtime and to read the, the, the type of jobs. And at that point she, was, she didn't know what, that was, uh, that, what the reason for that. But then, and then one day she realized and she told me that's that way the teacher or the school were teaching us 
the ability to dream. There's different type of jobs. So you should imagine you should, you know, have this be, be dareful to dream. And I think somewhat we're missing that. And so, yeah. I don't think that's naive at all. Yes, of course, there are barriers in people's paths. And sometimes that's because someone's from a marginalized community. Sometimes there's discrimination based on sex or religion. Um, but everyone, everyone has challenges. Everyone has challenges. So the primary, the first, the very first step for parents with their children, I would say, is to teach your children to dream big. I like how you put that. Because if you don't dream big, you're not going to be able to overcome all those challenges. So I completely agree with you. So wow, we are, we, we, you are so inspiring to me. I just want to have you chat, uh, talk and give tips for another 30 minutes. We're almost at the end of the interview. I just want to ask you a couple fun questions before we end. So you are Indonesian. Uh, so I like to talk my, uh, ask my guests a couple cultural questions. What, what is your favorite Indonesian holiday? My favorite Indonesian holiday? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, hmm. I, I don't really, uh, this is actually what very sad. Up? I don't really, right. Uh, so this is not, this is not yet, it, I did not went there for a holiday, but actually I went there for work, but I really would love to go back. I very much enjoy every single trip that I, uh, my trip to Papua. I think uh, um, I think the Papuans they have one of the most sincerely beautiful hearts. I think they're the most the kindest people I've ever met, and and also you know the scenery everything is just so beautiful. I remember going to this village, very very remote village. Uh, it took us hours to go to go there, and then at night times you will have um, I think it's ladybug in the tree. So the tree would actually look like a Christmas tree. And, and so that's why it's not, I did not went there for a holiday. I went there for work, but I wish I would be able to go back and, and to spend more time there. Yeah. But, but of course there were no connection. So it might be the perfect holiday, right? Because the, my office will not be able to approach me. <laughs> yeah. Any day I get to see a ladybug sounds good to me. They're beautiful. <laughs> uh, and this will have to be our last question, unfortunately. But if you could go on a holiday or a vacation to the United States in 2022, no more COVID restrictions, right. what, what, right. city, what city would you pick? Um, this is quite interesting. Uh, so the last time I went to the U.S. was a long time ago when I was a little girl. So I don't remember much, but there is this memory um, uh, of every time it's every time every year during Christmas, I would have like this image of myself sitting. It was it's not this Christmas Eve, but during the Christmas season when it was so, so festive and everything, sitting in a co coffee shop in New York. So I don't know mm. how I have that memory, but it always every single time when it Christmas reminded me of that. I mean, I don't celebrate Christmas, but I always celebrate with my friends, and so. And, and I just love the festive uh, feeling, I think. And so I would definitely would like to go back or not go back because I haven't been there since when I was older, but I would like to um, make that vision into a reality somewhat. Sure. <laughs> yeah. The energy, the joy, yeah. the beautiful yes. decorations, hopefully yeah. a bit of snow, all of that. Well, unfortunately, we're gonna have to end the show. Morale, you've been such a wonderful guest. You really do inspire me. You are doing such Thank good you. work. You are having an impact on people. I know you don't do it alone. You have a team. Uh, we received a, a, I'm so proud from Salsa B. La Putri. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Every effort is a team effort, but all that you're doing and the impact and your goals and your passion, it is so appreciated. So thank you for what you do. And thank you for being a member of the Waisili Network and the, uh, the State Department family. So that'll have thank to you. be it. So thank you so much. So thank you to our wonderful audience. Thanks to all the great questions from our participants. Uh, and just, uh, we look forward to seeing you for our next show. So take care, everyone. Thank you.